Hey, what's going on everybody? Eric Shabazz here with the Startup Basement and today we're going to be talking about the essentially the age of of the trillion dollar company, right? We, we had Apple come in to close with like $985 billion market valuation and we have other companies that will eventually get there, Google, possibly Amazon, possibly, possibly Microsoft, especially when cloud computing fully kicks in and and the OS infrastructure start to really solidify on the internet and move away from you know your your on-prem or your 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 client side uh, OS running on a computer or on a server or on your physical unit, right? So we're gonna have this time where there's gonna be these billion-dollar companies, and what, what what they represent is first of all kind of a uh, a, a decentralized media peer-to-peer -peer relationship with customers, right? That means that you know we don't have to go through big media conglomerates in order for companies to talk to their customers. Typically before that, the model was, you know, you're a big company, you, you, you pay a lot of money for a million dollar advertisements, and they put your product or your name in front of your customers, right? And really the best way to communicate with your customers were through the media or through these media outlets, right? You, in, as intermediaries. Uh, and the reason they had that dominant influence is because they owned the airways. That wasn't the business that the typical technology company was in. So therefore, you have to go through them to speak to the people at a mass level. Now, here comes the Internet. All of a sudden, that's all decentralized, right? You don't have to go through media collaborators to get in front of your customer because your customer can go online. And they can go a million different places to talk to you. They can go to YouTube. They can go to Facebook. They can go to all these other platforms. Or they can go directly to your website and interact with you. Right? They just need to know about you and know that you produce value. So now the model changed from the big power player is not necessarily those centralized media conglomerates like CBS or ABC, but the internet. And what creates the value on the internet is what you can do for people ultimately. And technology companies have been doing the most. Google. Everybody has a Gmail account. Everybody uses Google Drive. Everybody uses all these free services and communication platforms, including Facebook. It allows us to communicate with people. It allows us to send documents. And they're allowing us to do this for free. Because of that, they're helping us. They're making our lives easier and more efficient. And because of that, they have influence over us. When somebody's helping you and giving you knowledge and making your life easier, when they talk to you, you're going to listen. Right? Imagine somebody helping you or tutoring you or mentoring you. They have influence over you. So that's why people don't understand that it's a reciprocal relationship. It's basic human psychology. You help somebody, then you have their ear. And so looking at that model and looking at the old model, which was the media as the intermediary between the companies and the customer base that they wanted to talk to, what did the media really do? Did they empower you? No, they kind of control information. They try to decide who's important and which companies you should know about. And basically, in many ways, they manipulated you. They manipulated you to do what was in their best interest or the companies who paid them the most money best interest. But what were they really doing for you? Nothing. They didn't create Gmail. They didn't give you technology to allow you to talk to anybody around the world. They didn't create Skype to allow you to see your loved ones no matter how far they are. They didn't create PayPal to allow you to send money to anybody on the internet and still be able to trust them. They didn't create any of those things, these media collaborates. So they really stopped giving you real value. If anything, they were hurting you. So what has been giving you this value? Technology companies have been giving you this value. And what I mean by technology is any type of entrepreneur or business that allow to make your life easier, especially today on the internet where they're giving a lot of these services for free or little to nothing. Because of that, we have had a mass adoption of these major platforms, Google. They make everybody life easier to find what they want on the internet. Because of that, that has given them massive influence that they wouldn't have been able to amass as as quickly if they were still operating on the old model, which is, hey, I'm Google, we have a really great product, but in order to talk to you, I need to spend hundreds of millions of dollars through CBS and all these advertising agencies to convince you that I'm good. That's changed because of the internet. People can go directly to you, find out how good you are, and on top of that, Google is giving you tools. YouTube accounts will allow you to upload an unlimited data, data bits to Google, to YouTube. You can put unlimited amount of videos on YouTube and you don't have to pay for any of the hosting. Now you can do all these things for yourself. And because of that, they're empowering you. You're giving them massive power. Because on the back end, they're taking in your data and they're converting that to advertising and converting that to money. So that was that's what's one part of the reason why these Emerging of these trillion dollar companies are made possible, both because of the internet, both because of the decentralized nature of 
being able to interact on a peer-to-peer -peer level with consumer and customer without any intermediary being the big media complex that try to control what you think and what advertisements you see. And then the second component of that is because it's the World Wide Web, not only are they selling to North America, what's typical the dominant markets were for these major players like Microsoft and Google, but now it's the entire world. Other countries, developing countries, are using their services, and they're truly becoming global companies. Even though they say that globalism kicked in long before this, this is the real solidification of globalism kicking in on the internet because you have people across borders logging on, buying things, interacting, using their tools. That's why we're seeing the growth of trillion dollar companies today because of those components that I just made, named. Now, it has other implications because simultaneously we're creating a new class of elite and they're the technocrats or what they call the age of the alpha nerds. These are very charismatic but very technical entrepreneurs who will lead us into the future because the problems, the new set of problems we'll be working on for the next 20, 30, 40 years won't be incremental in, in innovation. And a lot of those innovations won't be purely incremental and driven purely by capitalistic tendencies of the North American um, infrastructure. Meaning that typically when they innovate in a product, it's simply to innovate or iterate to a level where they can go to the market immediately and make some money from consumers. So it's very much capitalistic driven. But when you start dealing with more macro and fundamental issues like energy, sustainable energy, AI, and all these things, these are more technically challenging things to deal with. And they're not necessarily driven by incremental innovation, meaning that if they solve some of these problems, it may not be based on, hey, can I go to the market in a year and make more money from consumers in North America? These technologies that we're gonna be working on in the 20, 30, 40 years will have implications for the entire world, for humanity. We're talking about sustainable energy, we're talking about AI with massive computer power that can start solving some fundamental problems in the world, quantifying genetics, quantifying cancer, you know, all these type of things. These are problems and things that we're going to create companies and leaders in our society who are going to be extremely technical. And there's only a small group of people who are extremely technical. In many ways, these people who are like Elon Musk or a lot of these engineers, in many ways, even though they may not want to admit it or we may not want to admit it, they won the genetic lottery. Very similar to how a lot of NBA players like LeBron James won the genetic lottery. It's not a lot of people who are that tall, who are that athletic, who are that agile. Just like it's not a lot of people who are born with those right neuroplasticity that's passed on by luck through genes, through their parents' genes, to have that where it makes them capable to be a high-end engineer, physicist, neuroscientist, these technical things. There's some gene stuff perfectly with this where you may not have got it. And that's why engineers are so scarce in the world. We can create more, but the top end ones, I think that they won the genetic lottery. Until we find out more about how this works, I would have to say they won the genetic lottery. And because there's going to be a genetic lottery of people who are able to do these things and drive society forward, it's going to create a deity-like admiration for these people. They're going to be building all the technology. They're going to be dominating our lives. They're going to be making all the money. They're going to be controlling a lot of the industries. And there's going to be an inherent inferiority that comes from that because the average citizen are not gifted with that neuroplasticity, that those connections in the brain that cross-connect that allow them to deal with very com complex math and understand geometric shapes which allow them to be really fundamentally engineers, computer scientists, and very technical people, right? I'm not saying that we regular people can't learn it, but really, I would argue that this is very much a genetic lottery to a certain extent that while these people are able to do it, whether they want to admit that or not. It's, you know, they say that. So, because of that, there'll be an inherent insecurity where we'll feel less than we would know we can't do those things or we can't understand those things, we can't build those things. Therefore, we would deify the people that can and make they would be omnipotent. And that will build into the fact that they're already running the world, they already have the wealth, and now you have a psychological edge because we see them as something we can't obtain that would give them more power and control. So I do see a consolidation of wealth, power, and control happening on top of this technological revolution that will happen because of those things that I just mentioned. So there's a lot of implication to these $12 trillion dollar uh, corporations and, uh, and you know a lot of this came from this article I read from the Wall Street Journal called Blue Chips Ascend to Record Heights. Everything that I went over in this little I guess rant is going to be some of the implications of trillion dollar companies moving forward, uh, the, the rise of the technocrats 
which means a bourgeoisie elite class of people who amass massive amount of wealth and control and will be the designers of the infrastructure of our society moving forward when we get into sustainable energy, uh, cloud computing, AI, and all these advancements that are to come. They're going to be the small group of people who have the technical know-how and ability to build and lead these companies and ultimately lead the world. And we're going to be left in a situation where massive amounts of consolidation of power and wealth at, on a scale we have never seen. This is just the beginning. And we're going to have to really ask ourselves, are we free? Right? So we thought technology would lead us out of this. and It would distribute power and control and influence. But I think that we're going to go through a stage that our generation, I'm 31, and moving forward until I'm like 70 or 90, was going to have to deal with a very consolidated world where it's constrained, not freed. And I don't believe we're going to stay in that, but we don't have the answer for that. But just know that I believe that it is to come. That is the implication of the trillion dollar corporation. So there's multiple implications of it. Some of them are good, some of them are bad. Anyways, that's just my two cents.